Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles handy, and I trust and pray that you do, because the overhead is just for those who don't bring their Bibles. Okay, so I hope you have your Bible. Amen. And open with me to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Philippians 3, 12 through 15. This is a very uh, familiar portion of Scripture. I'm sure that you have heard probably 20, 30, 40, 50 sermons preached from this particular text, so please do not allow your familiarity of this text to block me out. Please uh, give me this moment to pour into your life and to love you with the truth of God's Word, because I think the Spirit of God has something to say to each and every one of us here today. And to challenge each and every one of us here today at the close of this year. Because like most people, at the end of the year, it's a time of reflection. It's a time of rewinding the year through our mind. And it's a, it's a time that we begin to set goals for the, for the upcoming year. Most do that. Most set goals. And as I begin to think of that, just that term goal, 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 being goal-oriented, I felt the Holy Spirit drop into my spirit the ultimate goal. And that's really the subject matter at hand that we'll be looking at in Philippians 3, verses 12 through 15. We're going to be talking about the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal. Verse 12, Paul, writing, says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Just glancing at that text, we can tell that the Apostle Paul had something in particular upon his mind as he began to pin those words. And he uses the vivid imagery of a runner, of a sprinter, somebody who is endeavoring after an ultimate goal, somebody who is running after something. So I ask the question, what are you running after today? What are you spending your time doing? What are you, what's, what's dominating your, your thinking primarily? As you think about this new year, what is it you're striving after? What is it you are running toward? We know that Paul in our text, he was running after one thing, and that was the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not just running, but he was enthusiastically running it's not that he was discouraged in the process of running or feeling obligated that he, have to, he had to run after the person of the Lord Jesus. No, no. There was something inside of him that says, I must run after Jesus. I must run after him. I must be changed. Isn't that something? The great apostle saying, I'm not satisfied with where I am. I got to run after him. And beloved, no matter how many years you have been running after Jesus, no matter how much you have allowed the Spirit of God to renovate you and to renew your mind, there's still room for more. There's still room for more. And some get cold and complacent in their pursuit after Christ. And then they say, well, why should I grow anymore? Well, why should you grow? Well, first and foremost, it spreads the fame of God. Have you thought about that? It spreads the fame of the Lord Jesus Christ. It spreads His glory. It confirms your salvation. It makes the truth attractive, appealing to others. It gives you assurance. 
and it enhances your witness to a lost world. May we in 2018 run in a greater fashion toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm not just going to leave you with that, run after Jesus, because Paul doesn't. Paul gives us, as I, how I see it, six steps in this passage of Scripture I just read to you. I view it as a staircase. So there's six steps in this staircase. And these are steps that Paul himself took. So we're going to see six principles on how we reach the ultimate goal. The first step is, and I'll give, him, I'll give these two at the forefront and then we'll pray. The first step is the awareness of our condition. Where you are now in your walk with the Lord. So Paul says, I'm aware of my condition. The second step he shows us is he gives maximum effort. Third step, he has a focused concentration. He sees his condition. He gives maximum effort. He has a focused concentration. The next step is he has the right motivation. The next step is he talks about the divine resources that we have. And the last step is consistency, meaning Keep doing the other five steps. Be consistent. Pray with me and for me as we ask God for His help as we minister on the ultimate goal. Father in heaven, we thank You this day for this divine, sacred privilege of standing before Your people, the body of Christ, the sheep of Your pasture. Father, we ask that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us and would help us, would instruct us. We ask that the Holy Spirit, who is the perfect resident teacher, who abides in the heart of the regenerate, will bring illumination to what you have to say this day, would bring a revelation to that which you would have us to apply to our life. Father, I pray that your word would go forward today, that there would be a manifestation of the truth and a demonstration of your power and a conviction of the Holy Spirit. For, Father, those elements are needed in each and every message. It doesn't matter if it's the first message of the new year or the last message at the close of another year. Father, we need your presence to saturate us and to aid us and accompany us as we give the word of life to your people. So help us this day. Bring edification to your people and may glory be given to you. Through Christ we pray, and everyone said amen and amen. Now let me get this ingrained in our hearts before we progress through our text today. Because it's so good to always get into the the sandals of the writer, the sandals of the one who penned these words. Because here is the Apostle Paul telling us that we need to be actively and enthusiastically pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ in each and every aspect of our life. And here's Paul saying these words. And Paul was an exceptional man. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter by what standards you judge this man. Paul was an amazing man, an exceptional man. When you look at his birth and his upbringing, it was exceptional. When you look at the man's discipline, it was exceptional. When you look at the nature of his conversion, it was exceptional. Acts 9, he's minding his own business. He's thinking he's doing God a service. He's totally disillusioned. And what does God do? He comes down, manifests himself in all of his glory and splendor to such the magnitude it leaves the man blind for three days. To me, that's exceptional. When I said yes to Jesus, I didn't go blind for three days. I didn't have, I didn't, I mean, I, I like Paul, we all get knocked off our horse, a pride. Right? That's what the gospel does, knocks us off our horse and says, no, let King Jesus now rule and reign in your life. But Paul was an exceptional man. He was an exceptional leader. He was an exceptional church planner. He was an exceptional disciple maker. He was an exceptional writer. He had an exceptional prayer life. You can go on and on and on how superior and great Paul was. And yet, 
this exceptional man says, I'm pursuing something. I am running after an ultimate goal. But before he gets to verse 12, in verses 4 and 7, we don't have time to go over it in detail. I just want to allude to a few things building up to verse 12. In Philippians 3, verses 4 through 7, he talks about his former life. He talks about those things that he lost. Aren't you glad that at salvation you lost some things? Aren't you glad that those you don't you know, have to deal with those things, those former things, those old things are gone? Aren't you glad you lost that stuff? But then Paul says in verses 8 through 11, he says, but I, I not only lost some things, but I gained some stuff too. Oh, hallelujah. Salvation is both subtraction and addition. He subtracts that which is hurtful and harmful, and he, he adds that which is healthy and helpful. Aren't you glad? That's Jesus. That's what he does. He's a, he's a good Savior and has a good gospel. So Paul says, I gained some things. He says, I, I gained the knowledge of Christ at that time. I gained the righteousness of Christ. Because remember he says there in verse 9, not to be found in my own righteousness, which is by the law, but to be found in the righteousness of Christ, which comes by faith. He says, I gained that. I gained a true knowledge. I can see Jesus. I know who he is. I'm wrapped in his righteousness. I know what it's like to feel the power of Christ rising up within me. I am so glad for the power of Christ that dwells in the lives of his children. Amen. Amen. You have it. You have the power of Christ within you. You have his presence, which is powerful. It's personal. It's for you. And it's perpetual. He don't leave you. The power is always available. Paul says, I gained that. I gained it. I also gained fellowship with him. And I gained the glory of Christ. After saying all of that, he gets to verse 12. Well, after somebody spends some time in verses 8 through 11, you're thinking, man, this guy's got it all together. This guy has everything you would want. But then he says in verse 12, not that I have already obtained it. You see the, how he just interrupts things here? He's talking, I, I lost this and I gained all of this, but not that I've already attained it or obtained it. What's he saying? That's the first step in our staircase. He's saying, I am aware of my need. I am aware to my true condition and state. He says, I am aware of who I really am. Though the elders at Ephesus may see one thing, I see another. Paul says, I know who I am. Let me pause and say this. It is good to have an honest evaluation of yourself. He says, not that I. That's an instant disclaimer. Paul's saying, I'm not perfect. He's saying, I'm not what I ought to be. Here's this exceptional man, the great mighty apostle, saying, I'm not perfect. I'm not what I ought to be. I recognize my condition before the Lord. And we can also say that Paul has come a long ways at the timing of our text here in Philippians 3 from the Damascus Road experience. From the Damascus Road experience unto the present of Philippians chapter 3, Paul has experienced some mighty revelation, some great intimacy with the Lord, some great transformation, great renewal of the mind, and yet this man still says, not that I've already obtained it. This disclaimer shines light on the fact that Paul was not satisfied with his walk that Paul longed for more of Jesus. He desired more of heaven, as it were, in the inner man. See, it's Spurgeon is famous of saying, little faith will bring a soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to the soul. And that's what Paul was after. Yes, little faith will bring you to heaven and praise God, but great faith will bring heaven down to the soul. 
Making you a great Christian, not just in the public life, but in the private life. Makes no difference how good the preacher preaches, how intellectual he may be, what, it doesn't matter. What a pastor is, what a preacher is behind the pulpit, what a singer is on the stage, what a musician is, what a greeter is, what a Sunday school teacher is. You could be the cream of the crop in the public, but what are you in private? That's the real you. That's the real me. Paul says, I know me. And Paul says, not that I have already obtained it. Paul is saying, I need to examine myself, which is spiritually healthy. The Bible says to test yourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? So we are to test ourselves. Paul would tell Timothy, Pay close attention, Timothy, to your life and to your doctrine. So self-examination is a must. In Romans 7.24, Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, this is Paul talking. And some view this verse, Paul is on the, on the brink of his breakthrough. I don't know. We know breakthrough came for Paul. But let me, under, let, me, let, me, let me underline this. We never leave the Roman 724 mentality, wretched man. Because sometimes we view sanctification as being increasingly delivered from sin, which is right. But there's another side to that coin of sanctification. And that is we become increasingly aware of what we really are before God. Paul, at the tail end of his life, still said, I'm what? Chief of sinners. Here's a man that in Philippians 3, this is from Philippians 3 to 10 at the end of his life, you're looking at 15, 18 years or so, and he's still saying, I'm a chief of sinners. Paul, you're being continually changed from one degree of glory to another. Man, you got it. He says, no, I don't. I'm still not perfect. I'm still not like the one who laid hold of me. That's what apprehended means. Did you know at salvation, that's what happened to you? Jesus Christ got a hold of you. And you responded to the hand. You responded to the tug. You responded to the conviction. And now you say, oh, okay, Lord, like Paul in Acts 9, what do you want me to do? And that's the day that began the journey of climbing this staircase that Paul is talking about here in Philippians 3. And it begins, we must never outgrow this stage. If you cannot say, oh, wretched man that I am, Spurgeon called this the morn of maturity. When I read that years ago, probably 10 years, I didn't didn't understand that. I understand a little bit better now. The morn of maturity when you really see the worm that you are without Christ. That's the problem with the church world today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. We don't understand the true total depravity of fallen man and the true glory and splendor and righteousness of Jesus Christ. We don't get it. Paul got it. And how does that happen? It comes from being baptized into prayer. And through revelation that comes in spending time in the Word of God. It happens in moments like this, the proclamation of the Word of God. So Paul says, I'm a wretched man, which is also a mark of increased sanctification. So we must search ourselves. Even David, a man after God's own heart, he would say these words in Psalm 139. In Psalm 139, 23 through 24, he says, search me. Boy, what a prayer. Asking the holy God of the universe. God, search me. And what? Know my heart. Try me. That means test me. And know my anxieties. David says, I know a glimpse of my problem. 
I know the first maybe couple tiers of my problem, but maybe I'm not truly seeing the depths of my problem. So would you search me and know my heart? What's David saying? God, you already know my heart. What he's saying is this, God, will you disclose my heart to myself? Try me and know my anxieties. Look at verse 24. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. So self-examination is a great subject, but it can very easily be misunderstood. It can. It doesn't mean that the Apostle Paul was a morbid man constantly walking around, I'm a wretched man, I'm a worm, blah, 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 right? Because I've been around that too. There's extremes. You've got to bring balance to everything. That's the challenging of preaching and teaching. You can't preach everything in one sermon. That's why you always got to come back. It's the truth. There's a reason why Paul taught five hours every day for two and a half years in Tyrannus there in Acts. And that's why the Bible says that all of Asia heard the word. I bet so. Five hours every day for two years. So the apostle was not morbid. He was not the man who was constantly checking his spiritual pulse and checking his spiritual temperature. But he was a man that understood who he really was. He did not live on assumptions concerning himself. Let me say it again. He did not live on assumptions concerning himself. And in essence, he was saying, God, help me not to be disillusioned to my true condition. And he was constantly looking at the standard. It's not your neighbor, friend. That's not the standard. I'm not the standard. Jesus Christ is the standard. And that's the one, my friend, you measure yourself by. So Paul says, I'm not, I don't want to be disillusioned to my condition. So i got to keep looking to the standard, which is Jesus, and be measured by it. So now do you see how this works? You never outgrow this. Because Christ is the standard that we are being measured by. So Paul saw the Christian life as a process. Not as an experience. Something that happens. Boom! It's lifelong. Now, can God do great things in an altar service? Absolutely. Can God cause great leaps of Christian growth at an altar? Yes. Does that mean it's over? No. But the mentality through the years is, I got it, man. And then what happens? Stagnation. Thank you. Coldness. Complacency. We become casual with our Christianity. And we lose ground because we've been misinformed. If something great and mighty could happen in an event, in an experience, well, then Paul's wrong here. And is Paul wrong? No, and we're not misreading him. It's very straightforward stuff. He says, I press on. I'm striving after. It's pretty straightforward stuff. He's saying, in essence, I'm moving. There's a process, not just a single event. Okay, enough time on that. First, first step is, I see my condition. And that's a good way to start in prayer in the morning. Lord, help me to see me for who I really am. That's why husbands, listen to your wives. God uses them to help us in our sanctification process. He does. I don't know what you're talking about, honey. I don't see that in my personality or my character. Well, it's there. Well, poor thing, you're just disillusioned yourself. And then all you got to do is just ask the Lord and He will quickly and readily show you by putting His finger on that issue. Somebody say amen. Amen. So Paul says, I know my true condition. Okay, Paul, how do you respond to your condition? Now that I know that I'm a wretched man, I know that I need to be changed, what do I do about it? 
Glad you asked. Okay. Look what he says. But I press on. There in Philippians 3.12. Not that I've already attained or, all, or I'm not already perfect. Paul says, I don't have it. So what do I do? I press on. How good is that? Because so many times when we know what we really are, we get, I guess there's no hope. We get stuck in the mud. Get discouraged. Paul says, I see my condition. And you know what I'm going to do about it? I am going to press on. And when you look at those two terms in the Greek, press on, it carries with it the idea of maximum effort. Paul says, I didn't just tackle this thing with a half-baked, half-hearted kind of thing, like, well, let me just try this. He says, no, I'm going to give maximum effort. When I was thinking about this this morning and just praying over this, the Lord brought a verse to my mind that I didn't put down when I was writing this message out. But he says in, in Isaiah 64, talking about maximum effort, I press on. Which press means to run. It means to pursue. It carries the idea of a sprinter who's aggressive and energetic. That's the idea. Well, we need more Christians like that. A little aggressive in a godly way and energetic for Jesus. So Paul sa Isaiah says this, Isaiah 64, verse 7. And there is no one who calls on your name. Why? Well, that's the depravity of man again. It takes God to intervene in the life, right? Okay. Who stirs himself. Talking about maximum effort. Who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. What's Isaiah saying? Well, the nation of Israel at this point in their history had become very cold and complacent. They lost sight of their condition. Well, we got it. We're the Jews. We got the Ten Commandments, but didn't live by them. They didn't practice what they knew. So they became cold. And Isaiah says, there's no, who, who's calling on the Lord? Who's stirring himself up? Who's giving it maximum effort? You see it? Who's given maximum effort? And as a result, you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. So Paul says, I give maximum effort to the process of my sanctification. Sanctification is not entirely let go and let God mentality. That's only a part of your sanctification. Understand me. It's not just let go and let God. That's the passive side of your faith. But there's also an active side of your faith. Faith does something. Right? It's, it, faith drives you to prayer, doesn't it? Why? Because you believe in whom? A God that is greater than your circumstance. You believe in the goodness and the greatness of God to carry you through your circumstance. If you're not a praying man or woman, that's a reflection of your faith. But when we believe in the greatness and the goodness of God, it drives us to prayer. That's the active side of our faith. So the passive side says, I believe that God is able. And we must grow in our passive trust of Him. Because if we don't, we become confident in ourselves. Somebody please help me. We become confident in ourselves. We become confident in our experience. We become confident in our abilities. We become confident in us. We must grow increasingly in the passive side of our faith, saying, God, I trust you and you alone. I trust you. And then the active side, we are to grow as well. That's what Paul's talking about, the pressing. He's saying, I'm pressing in my faith. And I'm pressing also in what my faith produces, which is prayer, Bible reading, church attendance, giving, works of ministry, fill in the blank. Paul says, I'm pressing into that. Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. More could be said, time didn't permit. So Paul is pressing toward the prize. He's actively following after something. Notice what he says. I press on 
I see my condition, and now I'm going to give maximum effort. Well, toward what? Well, I press on. Why? So that. That's called a henna purpose clause, meaning in order that. I see my condition, therefore, I am now pressing on in order that. There's a reason to my action. There's a reason for my effort. My effort's going to produce something that I may lay hold of that. Lay hold of that. What's that? That's what he's saying, I, that I may lay hold of that. But we've got to ask the question, what is that? What are you talking about, Paul? I press on that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of. Something grabbed me and now I want to grab something. What's he saying? Jesus grabbed me and it did something. What did it do? I see my condition. What did it do? It produced a direction of life. Oh my goodness. Yeah, biblical Christianity. When Jesus touched me, it did something. When Jesus touched you, it did something. It made you see yourself for who you are, not how mom and dad see you or grandma and grandpa see you, that sweet little boy and sweet little girl. My grandma, in her eyes, I did no wrong. Boy, did I have her fooled. Just being honest. So Paul says, I was laid hold of so that I can lay hold of something. What is that something? The context is perfection. Absolute perfection. He's saying, I'm trying to lay hold of that of which Jesus laid hold of me. Did you know Jesus grabbed your life to do something with it? To produce something in it? For you to be His hands and His feet and His mouthpiece? To spread the fame of His name? To show His glory to your neighbor? What's your neighbor's name? Do you know him? I remember this. This is, the, this is years ago. It's a different denomination, so I can say it. You won't even know him. But this pastor, he was trying out at a church. And during the Q&A session, one of, uh, actually one of the council members stood up and said, Will you be willing to... Come and talk to people in my neighborhood about Jesus. Will you be willing to go to my neighbor and tell them the good news? The pastor trying out said, absolutely, I will. What's your neighbor's name? The man stood silent. Didn't even know his neighbor's name. The guy trying out says, and you want me to share the gospel with your neighbor that you don't even know? How long have you lived there? Oh, 20 years, shame on you, sit down. I did not make that up, that's verbatim. He said, shame on you, sit down. It's true, right? So when Jesus lays hold of us, it produces something. We, when we see our condition, then we have sympathy upon the human race. Because now we see the condition of the human race. We recognize the disease. Before Jesus came, we didn't see the disease that we had. We didn't see the pollution and the power, the degrading power of sin. But when Jesus grabbed a hold of us, eyes were opened, heart was opened, understanding was opened. That's what the Bible says verbatim. Opened. So Paul says, I see my condition, now I'm giving maximum effort. Look at Romans 8.28. Because Jesus laid hold of us for a purpose. And we know, we, we love to quote this verse. We do, because we, we, we want all things to work together for good. But sometimes our good and God's good are two different things. It's true. It's true. There's many preachers today who are going to be promising health and wealth and prosperity to their congregations. You're going to be healthy and wealthy and well off in 2018. I'm here to tell you that I don't know what's going to happen in your life, but I do know this, God's grace is sufficient. Period. God's grace is sufficient. It may be a devastating year. God's grace is sufficient. Okay. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. He's, where he's saying, I, I work all things for good. 
Well, what's the good that you're after? Verse 29. For, because, that's what it means. Because whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of who? The Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Paul says, I know why Jesus grabbed me. It's so that he may conform himself in my life. I see my condition. We can give a message for each of these points, but we can't. I see my condition. I got to give maximum effort. Maximum effort. So why did God save you? To make you like his son. He saved you to make you like Jesus. So, beloved, we are engaged in an energized pursuit. So Paul says, I see who I am. I'm giving maximum effort. Now what? Verse 13. Philippians 3.13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. He's reiterating again. He really wants them to get this. He, what he's saying, and he's stressing it, I'm not there yet. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. What's he say here? But what? Thank you. But one thing I do, man, that that, that should hit us all very hard. One thing I do. What is that? That's focused concentration. You see what he's saying? Put, Put it together. Here's the staircase. I see what I am, but I see who he is. I'm going to give maximum effort for my Lord. I'm going to have a focused concentration on this thing. I'm not going to allow the world, my friends, my family to sidetrack me or to derail me. I am after the prize. I am after the ultimate goal. He says, this one thing I do, that's focused concentration. Man, the more I, when I I read this this morning, I got up, I'm thinking, this one thing I do. I'm thinking, you know, Lord, there's many days the one thing I do is worry. This one thing I do, doubt. This one thing I do, speculate. Will you really, God? This one thing I do, complain. This one thing I do. What's the one thing you do? That's why the last point is consistency. (laughs) Because we don't do this consistently. One thing I do. Paul was not, what he's saying is this, there's one thing I do. I'm not double-minded, I'm not double-hearted. He had a driving compulsion. And look what this this focused concentration produced. Almost like a runner who's running. He's looking for the finish line. He's not saying, oh, look at the mountains, the trees, the flowers. and, And slows down the pace. A runner saying, I'm fixed, I'm not paying attention to the landscape. People will slow you down, man. They will slow you down. Don't look at the landscape. Look ahead. So Paul says, this one thing I do. Okay, Paul, what did your focus concentration produce? He says, one thing I do. It produced a negative and a positive. It says, forgetting what lies behind, that's negative, and reaching forward to what lies ahead, that's positive. We must forget those things that are behind. Because the one who's focused straight ahead, they won't be living in the past. But so many times we get bogged down because we look at the past. And therefore we're not running in the present or moving into the future, spiritually speaking. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, quote, The Christian life is impossible without discipline. We must control ourselves. We must divide up our time. We must realize in a world that is so set against us that if we do not discipline our spiritual life, we shall certainly find ourselves in trouble, end quote. This is true. This is what Paul's talking about here in the text, discipline. Not losing sight of the condition of who he was. Not losing sight of his effort. Not losing sight of his concentration. Now, I'm sure you've you've heard many things about forgetting those things that are behind. 
And we all know that pertains both to the good and to the bad, right? Well, Paul is saying, forget past victories, forget past achievements, forget the bad, past sins, past failures, past disasters, just forget it all and move forward is what he's saying. But let me bring balance. There is times and occasions when looking back can be healthy if we don't look too long. It's good to look back to admire the achievement of what's been accomplished in your life because of Christ. It's good to look back at times on past failures to say, mm, I don't want to do that again. But just don't keep looking. It's like a man climbing a mountain. If he just stares at the summit, he's overwhelmed. Boy, I have a long way to go. But if he takes a glimpse, but I've climbed pretty high, then it will bring encouragement to keep climbing the mountain. So before this year ends, look behind you. How far have you climbed? On the Mount Everest of Christ's likeness. Look back at the pain. Look back at the hurts, how Christ brought you through each and every one of them. And let that motivate you, forgetting what's behind. Now reach forward to what lies ahead. And only the Lord knows what lies ahead in 2018. But I do know this, when Paul says reaching toward, that term reaching, once again, it means to stretch every muscle the word picture in the Greek is a sprinter who's about ready to break the line and he's straining every muscle to make sure that he crosses first. Paul says, once again, I'm giving maximum effort to cross this line. Then in verse 14, winding down, he says this. So once you're aware of your condition, you give maximum effort, you have focused concentration. He says, I press on. He says it again, repeating himself, I'm still pressing, I'm still pressing toward the goal. There it is. There's the spiritual motivation. The goal for the prize of the what? Upward call. Stop right there. It's so good. Before I thought about that, upward call. And, and commentators have spilled a lot of ink debating what this means. In my opinion, take it for what it's worth, I view the upward call just bouncing with Scripture, what it teaches theologically, because the second coming of Christ produces holy living. It's designed to. When he says the upward call, I think that's a direct reference to the rapture. What he's saying, I press toward the goal for the prize. There's a prize coming, and we're going to get it when we cross over into glory. Of the upward call, Paul says, my motivation is this. Yes, this is not my home, but there's coming a day, a moment, an hour. It could happen even now as I'm writing this, he's thinking. And I want to be ready. I want to be as close to him as possible with the time that I've been given. So our motivation, beloved, in climbing this mount of Christ's likeness is that Jesus Christ is coming back. So Paul says, I press toward. Now I know the word toward, it may seem like an insignificant word. I press toward. What's, what's so significant about the word toward? When you look at it in the Greek, it really means this. The word toward in the Greek, it means to bear down on. I press means, it's a present active indicative, meaning continually. So Paul says, I continually press down on this goal. Think about it. So everything we said, put it together at this point. He kind of gives a summary here. So bear down on the goal of becoming like Jesus with maximum effort, focused concentration, and awareness of your condition. Paul says, I'm pressing down on this with maximum effort, focused concentration, motivation, and knowing my condition. He says, I am motivated by the upward call. Then he says in verse 15, he brings out how not everybody is going to agree with him. Not everybody is going to be pursuing alongside with him. So he says, therefore, don't you love that word? I love it. Therefore, in light of this, 
let us, as many as are mature, the King James used the word perfect, better translation is mature, therefore let us as many as are mature have this mind. What mind? The mindset of what? Pursuing. The mindset of pursuing Christ with focused concentration, maximum effort, and right motivation. Paul says, as many as are mature, meaning as many as have grown up a little bit in the Lord, they want this. He says, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, hmm, that's not necessary. Is that really needful? Do I need to do that? He says, and if anything you think otherwise, what will happen? God will reveal this to you. What's he saying? God has a way of putting us in the midst of circumstances to reveal to us what we need to change, what we need to repent of. Come on now, somebody. That's the purpose of circumstances of life, is to open our eyes, is to reveal some things to us. God, what are you showing me here? What are you revealing to me? So Paul says, God will send something to reveal to you what I'm talking about. And then he says this in verse 16. Singers, musicians, make your way back, please. He says, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained. Stop right there. To the degree we've already attained. Beloved, what degree have you attained in 2017? Think about it. What degree of Christ-likeness have you attained in this calendar year? Have you wasted time? We're all guilty to a degree of wasting time. Sometimes we do that. So Paul says, to the degree that we've already attained. In essence, what elevation have you reached on this Mount Everest of Christ-likeness? When you look behind, how high are you? What's your elevation in pursuing the Lord? He says, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk. Did you catch that? Let us walk. What's Paul saying? To the degree that you're at, he says, let us walk. Meaning, keep doing what you're doing. It got you this far. God's grace. Now, there's the divine resources. God's grace got you there. Let us walk. That's the consistency. Keep doing it. Keep walking. Keep trusting. Keep pursuing. Stay focused. Don't let the landscape slow you down or deviate you off the path. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. I love how he closed. He says, let us have the same mindset, church. Because he's writing the church of Philippi. Let us all be in an active pursuit of Jesus. That's why he laid hold of your life, beloved. You ever thought about that? Well, why did he save me? Well, it depends on what you've been taught. Some will say, well, he laid hold of you so you just have a better life, a better marriage, so you can get a good job, a good education. It's secondary. And you're, the Bible don't promise you that anyway. It's time preachers stand up and start saying what this Bible really says so the people are not misinformed and get angry at God over something that's not even right. God has promised that He will conform me and you to His image.